Public policy. Public policy is the action taken by Congress and the President to deal with the nation's problems. Public policy can include, but is not limited to, regulation of businesses, managing the economy, protecting the American people, and providing assistance. And that could be assistance to the American people or assistance to the world. The first step in public policy is agenda setting. Agenda setting, by definition, is identifying the problem. Unfortunately, a lot of times problems get the attention of the government and get the attention of the people if there's an event or a crisis. Like 9-11 proved to us that we needed counterterrorism efforts and policy. Hurricane Katrina proved to us that we needed to improve emergency preparedness policy. And unfortunately, the Sandy Hook shootings made it proof, or they were proof, that we needed some kind of mental health reform or gun control policy in the United States. The media also plays an important, pivotal role in identifying the problem. They are the gatekeepers. They help set the agenda. They tell United States people what is important. And then public opinion measures our response to things. Also, the media will work as watchdogs or investigators, and they're going to monitor government actions or lack of government action. And also, they're going to monitor businesses and see if there's something wrong that needs to be addressed. The second step is policy formulation. Policy for formulation is developing a solution to the problem that was identified. Congress, the president, lobbyists, they all think they know what is best to solving the problem. So they have two options. They can either work together and compromise to solve the problem, or what is more likely going to happen is they're going to realize that their, ide uh, their ideas of how to solve the problem are too different to compromise. Our system of checks and balances and federalism does make it difficult and time-consuming to write laws that solve our problems and to get these laws passed. It's a good thing because we don't want a solution to be too hasty. We don't want knee-jerk reactions and then laws that follow those knee-jerk reactions. We want good laws that will stand the test of time. That's what's awesome about our constitutional government, the fact that we have checks and balances. It prevents anything from from getting past it may be too trendy of a solution. But on the flip side, if you can't compromise, then you can't solve the nation's issues or the nation's problems. States also play into this. States don't always agree with what the federal government thinks is the right solution. Yet states, in most instances, are the ones that have to carry out the solutions. Like Obamacare. States have to pay or help pay to get people who can't afford health insurance insurance coverage. They have the burden of carrying out unfunded mandates. The government will pass down a crossover or cross-cutting sanction. They might not agree with it, but they're being told what to do with the by the federal government. Okay. Recent election trends show that there's going to be divided government. Split ticket voting increases divided government. And there's going to be gridlock because of political parties. The goal of a political party is to win elections. They have to win elections in order to control the formulation of policy. Political parties have to win elections in order to maintain majorities in the legislative branch or control of the executive branch. So they're going to have different ideas of what's best for developing a solution. Political parties have to build coalitions. They do this by promising to solve your problems and convincing the people that they have the best solution to the problem. Iron triangles. Okay, remember, iron triangle is the mutually beneficial relationship between lobbyists, congressional committees, and government agencies. Let's take terrorism and the war in Iraq. Lobbyists representing a private company or an industry or an interest group like Lockheed Martin, Halliburton, General Dynamics, um, GM, they all have something to gain 
from war. They all can sell the government products that will help fight wars. Congressional committees. Congress members who sit on the committee will receive info and campaign contributions from these industries. Sorry, my phone was ringing. Okay, um, so Congress members who sit on committees receive information and campaign contributions from these industries or interest groups, and some will later go on to work for the industry. So their solution to a problem like terrorism would be to invade Iraq. And then, because it will benefit the lobbyists that support them. And then agencies, the Department of Defense, they're gonna hire the private companies and that do the contract work for the war in Iraq. So all of them are going to have this mindset that maybe the best way to counter terrorism would be to invade Iraq. And then they start to go down that path and it's hard to reverse that as the accepted solution to our problem. Writing and implementing policy. So this is a how a bill becomes a law process. Okay. The major party has an advantage in this, the, or the majority party has an advantage in implementing or writing and implementing the policy. Besides the numerical advantage on the floor, the majority party has the speaker and the speaker can decide with their referral power whether to nurture or kill a bill. They have the chair of all the committees and more seats in the committee so they have more control over the markup process. It's important to remember the Senate and the House differences when making or writing policy or writing a bill. Okay, um, remember in the Senate you have to have germaneness so all of the or excuse me in the house your bills have to have germaneness which means that all of the um, additions to the bill have to be relevant to the original topic of the legislation so if you're writing a solution to um, the problem of lack of mental health care in this country all of the things that you add to that bill in the House must be germane and they must have to do with the original intention of the legislation, which would be mental health reform. Um, the Senate, you know, they can filibuster a bill, whereas the House they cannot, and the Senate can add whatever they want to, any kind of writers, any kind of pork to the legislation. Remember the presidential powers over this process. The pre president, of course, proposes solutions in the State of the Union address. He, or actually not necessarily him himself, but he has White House staff that will lobby Congress and communicate re with Congress about what the president wants. He uses the bully pulpit if he's popular. He can threaten to veto legislation. And when Congress won't solve the problem, he'll just issue an executive order. Agencies to implement. Remember, agencies draft the standard operating procedures. They're the ones that decide how best to solve or implement the solution to the problem. They're the ones who regulate or monitor businesses to make sure that they're carrying out the solution. They have discretion. That means that they get to choose how intensely they enforce a law, and that's not a power that's easy to give up. Remember, what is going to make good implementation, what is going to make a solution a good viable solution? The solution has to be clear. The agency has to have a good understanding of the goal of the legislation. And of course, they have to have the resources. Evaluating the effectiveness of policy. Of course, it's measured by public opinion. After a law is passed, we're going to then have Gallup polls and the Pew Research Center take people's opinion through random sampling on 
what they think the effectiveness effectiveness is of the policy. You saw this with Obamacare. Lots of polls indicated that people did not like the website. There's still a lot of kickback on how the website is too difficult to navigate, to buy your own insurance, the health care exchanges. The Affordable Health Care Act is not really an effective policy in the public's mind. Then you're going to do a cost benefit analysis if the government, if you're the government. Is the money, time, and resources spent on implementing this policy returning your positive results? Is this worth taxpayers' dollars? An example, Clean Air and Water Act. Is it, is it really effective? Is the EPA really spending the money well? Is the cost of regulation to businesses worth some kind of pollution control? Is the cost passed on to the consumers really saving the environment? Of course, people with different ideologies will produce different perceptions of the effectiveness of legislation. Okay. Um, also, some solutions will be sunset legislation. Okay. If a goal of a piece of legislation can be achieved quickly or lawmakers believe that within a decade or so the po policy will no longer be needed, then are you going to have that policy expire? Is busing in the st South really still necessary to integrate schools? Or are neighborhoods just diverse enough to get rid of busing and allow that kind of legislation to expire? If they don't think so, then the policy would be renewed, and we'll keep the policy on the books until we really see that the problem has been solved. Of course, when you're evaluating the effectiveness of policy, you have to play into the constitutionality of policy. That's where judicial review comes in. Is the law even legal, constitutional? Um, case study, campaign finance laws. So we had campaign finance law passed in the early 70s. 30 years later, when the American people were asked, does campaign finance reform, is it really effective? Most people said no. 